J. Chapman. I'm retired, but I'm president of the McDowell County Historical Society. I'm also president of the Kimball Rotary Club. I'm a member of the NW Historical Society, also the National Script Collectors Association, which is over 500 members in that group. Well, when I came out of the Navy in 1971, I got a job at the Welch Daily News within about two weeks in the advertising department, which I stayed there 35 years. And uh, I uh, worked on, they had an annual coal edition. Uh, it was the first paper to ever have one, and now the last paper to ever do one. But uh, involved with that coal edition every year, we would get old photographs and bits and pieces of stuff, you know, to put in the edition to see how it was and how it progressed over the years. And along the way, I got interested in the historical part of it, and I started collecting it. And now I've got a 40-year collection of coal mining stuff. I've got enough stuff to fill his whole building here. So, it's been a while. Most of that happened around 1914 to uh, 1921. Uh, Paint Key, Creek and Cabin Creek uh, was uh, a real volatile place in those years. Um, there were shootings up there and killings. Uh, the cut companies up there, they uh, hired the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency out of Bluefield. And they were a detective company that most of the major railroads had used, like CNO, BNO, Virginian, uh, N and W, uh, to name a few. Uh, they also had uh, some of their employees were sent to areas undercover to infiltrate into certain things, like especially during the coal mine, the, the Union. That's uh, what led to the shootings of Mate One. That was a situation where. A gentleman named C.E. Lively was down there undercover, uh, set up with a, I can't remember what kind of store he had, but uh, either it was a hardware or a combination thereof of uh, a saloon, I'm not sure, but it was some type of business there in town. And he was there to gather information at the time when uh, the Stone Mountain Coal Corporation and Lynn Coal and Coke Company that was there, they were trying to uh, keep from the union from coming in. And uh, they, with the Baldwin Felt detective undercover there, he was passing information back to Bluefield about what they were trying to do down there. And then that led to uh, arrests and shootings, evictions out of co-company houses, and which all that led up to the, the uh, they call it the Mate Juan Massacre, or it was a the shootout they had on the back street down there, down from the station, where about, I think, 11 people were killed, including uh, Al and Lee Fels, who were leaders of the Ball and Fels Agency. That's when Sam, Sid Hatfield supposedly pulled both guns. He, he carried two pistols. And in the confrontation, as close as me and you were closer, he pulled both pistols out and shot them both in the head. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was pretty, pretty rough bunch of folks back then. Of course, he was on the Union side. Sid was. But uh, after that, uh, the brother, older brother Tom Phelps was still in charge of the agency in Bluefield. Uh, they was after Sid and Ed Chambers, the deputy, uh, was involved with that shootout. And what they did, supposedly they trumped up charges on them, but they had dynamited the coal temple in Mohawk, which was in the McDowell County side. And see, McDowell County uh, was a stronghold for Bowen Feltz and non-union. But they got them here to try them here in court for the dynamiting they're supposed to have done. But in reality, they didn't do it. But they got them here to kill them. That's what they did. They, they came to town for the trial, and when they walked up the steps, went up as soon as they turned up the first set of steps off the landing there, uh, I think it was six, maybe ten, my ball on field scars was at the top, drew their guns and shot uh, Sid, and they were both dead on the, on the sidewalk. And their wives were standing with them, and how they got missed, I don't know. They, they didn't get touched. Supposedly, they said that Sid and Ed had a gun. And supposedly they said they left their guns at the Welch Hotel. But that's a controversy there. But there was only three people I think tried for that. Uh, it was C.E. Lively, uh, Buster Pence, and uh, a, bill, a guy by the name of Bill Slater were tried in the courthouse and they were acquitted. They, they got off. So, volatile time between 1914 and 1921. Even after that shooting, that led to the Blair Mountain insurrection at Logan County, 
that's when you had over 5,000 miners, or maybe as much as 10,000 that marched from uh, Madison and Boone County. It had gone through Logan to make one, and uh, Don Chafin, the sheriff in Logan County, was on the side of the mine operators, Baldwin Phelps. And what they did, they, he uh, deputized about 500 combinations, uh, police, and people to stop them from marching through Logan County. And that led to the Blair Mountain insurrection. So there's a lot of information on that. You can check that out. What? This county alone right here, at one time, the uh, world beckoned the door of this county. There was people from all over the world came here. Because of the mining of coal, what kind of coal it was, uh, getting, he mentioned something, uh, that shooting at the courthouse, there's little indentions up there. It's kind of wore down over the years where some of the bullets actually hit uh, the columns in front of the courthouse up there. But, you know, uh, that uh, insurrection, the governor had to step in and call martial law. They sent in the federal troops to uh, stop it. And uh, they stopped it. It was just, I think just a couple of people actually were killed and they were very, very fortunate that it was all. They even commandeered a train, CNO, during that time and uh, took the train by, uh, and that was actually down at Pine Creek. Uh, there was a tent city set up down there for the miners where they were evicted out of the coal company houses and the union was trying to help them including Mother Jones. I don't know if you've heard of Mother Jones. Okay, she was in that situation but she was on the union side. But the train was set up with a, a machine gun on it and when they went by the tent city they sprayed the tents. I think there was one person killed. Again, they were very fortunate that it wasn't more than that. But I think they were smart enough that when they Inside the tents, they dug below the tent line, and uh, actually some of them had metal pieces around their beds to keep the bullets off, and they slept below the ground in case there was any shooting. It, you know, they, a lot of them did that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, like I say, it's uh, it's a really important part of history right here, and nobody knows about. It's just the idea because you're getting some, getting some pictures off of them that you're not going to get anywhere else because of what they are. Uh, they would be pictures of certain uh, structures that somebody probably wouldn't even think about taking a picture of, but they did the postcards. You can get, you can actually get a good comprehensive collection of postcards for any one particular area if you were able to obtain them all. But they're spread all over the place and it, it's just like uh i, I kind of equated to putting a puzzle together all of a sudden you get a postcard picture up here of, of a structure on this side of the area you know, maybe you get one over here then you maybe get one or two in the middle and you realize there's others that you can fill in to make the whole area and that's what it is you can actually piece together an entire community or town or county on pushcarts if you were able to obtain them all. Yeah. Stepped in and told the uh, companies that if a miner had come in with a dollar piece of script, let's say, instead of getting goods for it, he could ask for money. Well, when they started that, then they quit script. Then what mm -hmm. happened to it was they uh, destroyed it. They Put it down mine shafts, they bored holes in the mountainside and put it down in there and concreted over it. They sent it to uh, metal companies like uh, Polk County's Fuel Company was in Bishop. Uh, they took theirs to a metal company, West Virginia Armature, and they melted it down in Bluefield. So <clears throat> a piece made in 1914 and a piece, let's say, made in 1951 based on how they did away with it. The piece in 1951 could be worth more by 10 times than the piece in 1914. You don't go by the age of it. Yeah, you go by how the companies, how well they did away with their script when they uh, destroyed it. So, this book here is all McDowell County script, uh, usually by the, the company name. And uh, when you're a script collector, what you try to do is make sets of script which you want to set of a dollar through the nickel, which is a dollar, half, quarter, dime, nickel. Some companies had pennies. Some companies had five dollar pieces. Uh, there's a few had tens. Only one company had a twenty dollar piece. That was a company out of cold good Kentucky. Um, there was a few companies had oddities, like a two dollar piece from 
Pioneer Coal, uh, coal Company out of uh, towards Kanawha County. There was a four dollar piece from Line and Gulf Collieries over in Mercer County. Uh, just a little oddities like that. Well, incidentally, out of all the counties in any state that had scrip, the most sought after scrip is MacDowell. Okay. That's the most. It, because the county was such an important county in, in the uh, process of mining of coal and what it meant to the world. Uh, just the mining of coal itself from this county spurred the NW Railway to come down through here by Elkhorn from Bluefield and run the main line through here. Uh, instead of going through what's called Clark's Gap in Mercer County and down through uh, Traley and the Mullins. They was going to go that way. They had anticipated the track down through there. But the Crozier family, who had holdings in the Elkhorn area, enticed the president of NW to change the line over and come down through Elkhorn. And as a result of that, they did. But uh, it progressed so much that in 1914, the NW Railway electrified the railroad from Jaeger to Bluefield. They had electric engines. And they had the pantographs, uh, the catenary system up all the way through. And uh, there's pictures on that. You can get, there's some hardback books you can get through the NW Historical Society on the electrics that uh, if you're interested in acquiring a little collection of books, I highly recommend that one. But, uh, but the script, uh, let me show you something. If you're going to take a picture of it, I'll try to find you a piece that you can see pretty good. You might be able to get. This is a dollar uh, from a Houston Collieries Company. It's out of Kimball, but the location is Carswell. Most any piece of script, uh, average piece is uh, average piece is worth about ten dollars now. But there are pieces in this book that's worth three hundred fifty dollars. And that depends on the scarcity. Uh, again, I was mentioning to you. Uh, that was disposed of. Well, there's one grouping. Uh, I don't have it in here. I got it in. See, I grew up in Superior between Kimmel and Welch in the 1950s. My father worked there. Uh, they had a deep shaft mine. There was two shafts actually. But he ran an electric mine motor in the mines, hmm. pulling pulling loads to the bottom of the shaft where they brought the, the cage up to dump the uh, wooden mine cars in a bull wheel fashion, and they they tumbled down. And in fact, that's where they get to work tipple. Coal tipple because the car went to the top and they tipped it and it dumped the coal down and then went through screens and they had different grades of it but that's what he did and he would haul empties back in and see my mother she worked in a coal company store for about 20 years so I kind of grew up in a coal company store too now I've got a nice photograph of that taken in the 30s of the front showing old cars out front showing a Maytag most machine in the showroom window mm -hmm. uh, yeah fantastic picture that's a great store and the exterior building is pretty much the same as it was uh, when they built it. Uh, I think it was built in uh, 1930. Uh, the original store, store was a big wood building, uh, about two or three stories. It caught fire and burnt down in 19, about July of 1926. And then they built the new store back and along with the, uh, the post office and the mine office was there out from it, built out of the same material. It's gone, they tore it down. Uh, post office used to be in the bottom of it because they used to get mail down there. Um, but the store building is pretty much the structure itself is still the same. Now the interior they've partitioned it off, but it's uh, it was just a big open area down in there. The temple that's up there now, there's a couple of components of it. The the uh, superstructure where the bull wheels are, those have been there since the 1930s. Uh, that matters. I started operation before 1900 under the name of Dixo Polka. A guy by the name of Sam Dixon uh, owned the operation. Um, it was called Huger before 1913. That was named after a guy, Frank Huger, who was superintendent of the uh, Anadabri Railways Polka Division. Uh, it changed to Superior in 1913. Because the Algoma Steel out of Canada bought the operation for $55,000 and a guy came in by train with cash on him and paid for the mines. Uh, they changed the name from Huger to Lake Superior, or it's shortened now to Superior. But the railroad still referred to it as Huger. Railroad don't change names. They keep the old names. But it's been continuing operating ever since 
that particular time. Now there's no deep shaft up there. They filled all those in. The coal that's being processed through there is coming from areas like um, up Carville, uh, down towards Davie. It's trucked in, they dump it above there, and they shoot it down through the, the tip of the railroad cars. There. That was probably, that's I think the only considered bigger prep plant in the county now. There's one, a new one that opened up over Coretta, where the old Coretta t uh, mines was. They went in about a few years ago and they they reclaimed that whole area where that old Coretta Tipple sit, and then they put in a whole new complex over there. They're hauling coal in there and dumping it, and it's being shipped up a rail car. The railroad actually put a new, put a new spur up through there. So all that's new over there now. I'm kind of surprised a lot of people that they did that, but they did. Well. Yeah, yeah, they built a new <laughs> uh, new buildings, uh, cleaning screens and stuff like that, and they uh, put the coal through it. And, shipped out in rail cars. Uh, the railroad put a spur. Uh, we, we did all the track work up through there, passed it. Uh, the cutting out of the useless EPA regulations. When uh, they took those things off, it spurred growth and, uh, you know, mining of coal again and putting people back to work, stuff like that. The last, uh, you know, coal business has been an up and down thing ever since it started. Uh, it's never been a continual out of work or working situation. It had work a good five, 10, 15 years, and then you have a strike, or and nowadays you don't have many strikes, but you have regulations through the EPA sometimes uh, under the last administration, which um, bottleneck the process of mining and jobs and stuff like that, which was useless. Uh, it killed the economy. I mean, it's bad enough around here, much less the government coming in and trying to shut you down. Yeah. So, you know, that's, um, that is still a primary uh, source of income here. Although that's changing, we're, we're becoming a tourism county now, and that's only going to grow. The ATV trails are pushing that agenda. Uh, there's actually people investing here outside the county. Uh, North Carolina folks have bought probably 15 or more houses and property in Norfolk Holla just for the ATV experience. And it's the same concept, like if you uh, have a boat and you got a, a lake you want to go to, people buy homes and houses around the lake and a boat dock, and you go there and you, and, you, know, you take your boat. Same concept here, instead of a boat and water, you've got an ATV in the mountains. Same thing. And what they're doing, they're buying houses here and fixing them up like you would around the lake. And uh, come in here and stand and take their rides and stuff like that, and they're investing here. That, that's, that's a good thing. They're buying old coal company houses that's being dilapidated and fixing them up, cleaning them up. And it's a buyer's market right now for houses and property and buildings. That's attractive to a lot of outside investors. If you've got something going on, and right now you do. With the investors, there's opportunity all over this county right now. That started <coughs> before 1900, actually. The Hatfield McCoy feud probably stemmed a little bit of that because it was a bunch of people back in the mountain they were fighting and outside people they just thought that was awful you know they were maybe thought it was uneducated well that was not like that uh devil s hatfield for instance was an educated guy matter of fact he was a senator so i mean you know they they don't look at the full picture of about a person or a place they just assume the stereotyping effect but this area here, uh, there were so many smart people came in here to mine coal. They were not dummies. Uh, these uh, early operators came here and brought property in 1880. They had uh, had experienced themselves. A lot of them were lawyers, uh, very important people. A lot of them went on to be senators and judges from this county. But the stereotyping is bad. Uh, the news media also was a part of that, starting in the 20s. They've come in here and they covered the worst thing they could find, never found anything good. Even today they do that. They'll come in, they'll see an old junky looking place and over here something fixed up. Well, they don't want that. They go over and get the chunky place. And that's what they portray. They don't show nothing else. Uh, we've had quite a few different news media here. Last probably five years there's been uh, a TV crew from Spain, Australia, Washington Post people's been down here, CBS was down here last fall. I mean, you know, they uh, 
they don't come in here for anything good. You have to question that when, uh, when they come in and want to talk to you. Well, the, 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 probably the best thing about this area is it's people. It's always been that way. Um, the people here are the most accommodating people you ever met. Even the people that come in here on ATV rides, they go back and tell folks that they, they talk to somebody up some hollow like they, they've known them all their life. They said, you don't get to nowhere else, and they're willing to help you. Of course, that's the cold camp lifestyle of all the ethnic backgrounds that came in here to work together. It, it stemmed from that. Uh, there was never any animosity here or against any particular group. Everybody worked the same, everybody shopped at the same store. And uh, when you had that situation and everybody else come to this one place, uh, it kind of gelled together over a period of time. That's, uh, that's the best thing that for this county is that. But the scenic views of the mountains, the history of it, um, and what it meant to the world is thriving, this uh, new uh, thing with tourism now. And that's going to be a big thing for this county.